afternoon. Any questions? Okay. Um, I will talk about the uh, quiz during the second hour. Uh, but last time on springs, we covered the static part of loading, uh, yielding factors of safety for yielding and all of that, and um, also covered possibility of buckling and surge of, uh, no, surge, I guess we have not covered. Buckling we covered. And um, today we'll take a look at other aspects of uh, either analysis or design of springs. Um, there's this table 10.3 in your book, uh, which lists a number of different types of spring materials and uh, their description and sometimes applications as well. Um, so you should read that and be familiar with it. It is nothing that you should memorize, of course, but be familiar with it. And then you have um, these uh, tables 10.4 and I believe 10.5 that talk about uh, the uh, strength of spring materials. In order to be able to uh, calculate factors of safety, be it for static loading or fatigue, uh, we need to figure out the, uh, or know, the strength of the wire from which the spring is made. Uh, <clears throat> spring wire, uh, usually relatively small, although you have very large springs as well. But uh, what has been found is that as the wire diameter decreases, we see that the strength of the material of the spring increases. This is generally due to what we've talked about before, the possibility of existence of flaws is larger in a larger volume than it is in a smaller volume. There is an equation that allows you to calculate the tensile strength of um, the spring wire and it looks like this, SUT equals A over D to the M. If you uh, plot this um, equation on a log-log scale, uh, A becomes the intercept and M becomes the slope of the line. This will, will be the equation of a straight line, similar to SF equals A N to the B. Um, we don't usually use this in the log form. We use it in the form that you see. The two constants, A and M, are found from the table on the screen. These two constants, depending on the material that you are using. And uh, they are given both, uh, the constant M is the same in both systems, whether you're using the US customary system or the metric system. Uh, and the constant A is given for both systems. So you just simply refer to this table and find SUT unless it is otherwise given. Um, for some materials in table 10.5, um, the elastic limit or uh, yield strength of the material in torsion is also given as a percent of the tensile strength. So for example, for music wire, you see that between 65 to 75 and um, 45 to 60, the elastic limit of uh, the uh, materials. And that is the uh, percent of SUT. And if you read the caption, let's see if we can get the caption here. 
These are generally for pinned and unpinned uh, spring wire. Um, do you guys know what pinning? We talked about pinning here, did we not? A little bit. Yeah, it's, it's basically what we talked about before. Um, the um, oh, also these variations in the in the torsion may also be due to uh, presetting and lack thereof, because you can have a preset spring or a regular spring. Uh, but uh, pinning or shot pinning is a process in which you bombard the surface of a material with very tiny uh, hard steel balls and they produce uh, plastic deformation on the surface of the material and leave some um, residual stresses, compressive residual stresses. And any crack that would uh, like to open up or propagate uh, would have to be propagated by first overcoming the compressive stress and then putting in the tensile stress. So from that point of view, they are uh, stronger. And uh, these are given in uh, various In, in the two systems, and you can use that table as well. And this we've seen before, and this is a, a, a sample of what you had before. This is with set removal and without set removal. The, once again, maximum percent of tensile strength. And that's the allowable torsional stresses for uh, helical springs. Um, so we generally use this equation to come up with SUT, and then everything else we find uh, from SUT. Uh, ah. One of the things that we find uh, from this is the tensile strength of the material in torsion. And you see that picture on the board. In general, you can Use these numbers. SSY less than or equal to fifty two percent of SUT. greater than or equal to 35% of SUT. That's just the general range. So in case you have no better option, you can take an average value there. That's about 45%, approximately. Um, but it would be different depending on the treatment, whether the spring is manufactured hot rolled or cold rolled. That will have an effect on it whether it, is, uh, it, it, it contains a set removal or not, pinned or not. These are just simply very, very general numbers. And uh, your uh, yield strength in shear, and that's, by the way, what this is, yield strength in shear uh, lies between these two uh, numbers. Uh, <clears throat> when you design a spring, You generally don't know very much. They just say, loads are, these are the loads, and we would like this spring, for example, to, fill, uh, to fit in a hole or over a mandarin. And the loads are this, and it's going to function for so many number of cycles, for example. Uh, so you're, you're faced with a number of unknowns. And you're going to have to make assumptions on those unknowns, sometimes more than one. And just carry out the problem and see if it works or not. More often than not, it will not work on the first try. If it does, it's probably no more than 25% of the time at best. And that's for people who have a lot of experience in design. If you just pick numbers out of the air, you won't even get that. 
Um, so you have to give it, it's a trial and error problem and, and there are a number of uh, different uh, type of, uh, types of design software, Spring software, uh, on the market that you can use and just go through the uh, process uh, more or less uh, by pressing a button, if you will, and then just simply changing numbers until they satisfy the requirements. But in order to be able to change the numbers logically, you need to know what's in that software program and how it works. So that, for example, if the factor of safety for yielding doesn't come out to be what you're looking for, what do you change? <coughs> and whatever it is that you change has what effect on other things that were working before and may not work now that you've changed things? This is always a possibility. We'll take a look at a design problem uh, today to bring all of this out. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I would like to uh, talk about here is this. When you design a spring, let's say this is your relationship for the spring between the force and the deflection of the spring, the experimental equations or the experimental points that from which we get these types of equations actually look like this. And let's say that's solid height. So we'll call that Fs. They are sort of scattered in the beginning where the load is small. And they're scattered at the end when you're approaching the solid height. At the beginning, they're scattered because the loads are very, very small. And the difference in the deflections are difficult to measure. So they're very scattered there. At the end, they're scattered because more and more coils are coming into contact with one another. You're, you're approaching the solid height. And therefore, they're out of commission. They're not active anymore, or at least not totally active. So when you design a spring, you essentially design it for this portion, which is about 75% of the total Fx diagram. So that's what we design springs for. And for this and other reasons, uh, when we design spring for fatigue purposes, there will always be a little bit of preload to make sure that we get out of this range here, number one, and number two, that the spring will stay in place when loads start to vary. It doesn't start to move. So these are a couple of things to uh, take into account. Uh, we would like the spring never to reach solid height. So we should not design for that load. That's why we limit the load over here. In fact, uh, when you design a spring, you must make sure that the maximum applied force, the maximum force that will be applied to the spring is a little bit less than the load at solid height. <coughs> that little bit is approximately 15%. So we say that the maximum load, and your book just calls it fractional overrun, C. Oh, uh, the other way around. Like that. Called C is called uh, fractional overrun. It's about 15% or more. 0.15.
which comes out to be about one seventh. So that you will read uh, about that in the book, and that's what that means. And of course, it goes without saying that you would like the spring to never yield, even at solid height. Should someone overload it at, and take it to solid height, you still don't want it to, to yield there. So there's, there's got to be a factor of safety with respect to that. Uh, yielding process. Any questions? Uh, the next, uh, so what you should consider in design before I go to the next part, what you should consider in design is how the spring is going to function. Is it going to function freely inside the hole over a mandrel? If it's inside the hole, your outer diameter is limited. If it's over a mandrel, your inner diameter is limited. And of course, you use neither one of those two in calculations. You use the mean diameter. But that can be calculated from either one of those. So if you have a hole, let's say two inch hole, and you want a spring to fit there, you get some tolerance and you say maybe the outer diameter should be limited to 1.8 inches. So that will give you a 0.1 inch clearance between the spring and the walls of the hole. And then depending on the applied loads, you have to come up with a diameter for the spring and take the design further from there. In most cases, however, we assume a value for C. Remember C? C is the spring index. And it's the ratio of the mean coil diameter to the wire diameter. We said that this value, the value of C, should be somewhere between 4 and 12. So in many instances, you're best off to assume a middle value, 7, 8, or 9, uh, as a first try. And if the wire diameter is not given, sometimes you have springs available, so you try to use those if at all possible, sometimes not. So, but, so if the wire diameter is not, uh, is not given, or you don't have anything available, you're going to have to make an assumption on that too. And the example problem that we're going to see We'll do exactly that. We will make both of those assumptions. And then we'll take it from there if it doesn't work. Um, one of the possible failure modes of a spring is in what is called surging, or reaching a very high frequency of vibration, approaching the natural frequency of the spring. Uh, we would like, just like in shafts, where we limited the natural frequency, the uh, applied frequency of the loads to half of the natural frequency of the shaft, here also there, is, there should be uh, a ratio between the natural frequency of the spring and that of the applied load. Um, so frequency or natural frequency of uh, springs are measured by, uh, first they're dependent on how you support the spring. Is it between flat parallel plates? Is it fixed free, fixed pin, and all of that? Two of the uh, cases that we have, the natural frequency or critical fr frequency is 1 half the square root of Kg over W. This is uh, spring supported between flat parallel plates.
in this equation, k is the spring rate or the spring constant, g is the acceleration of gravity, and w is the weight of the spring, not the mass, but the weight. You can rewrite this equation as one-half the square root of k over m, and that works better in the metric system because usually you have mass in the metric system. We also have another one, a quarter of the square root of kg over w. This is uh, one end against a flat plate. The other end, free. Same definitions for kg and w, of course. Uh, so how do we calculate w? Of course, we can always weigh it, if that's a possibility. But if it's not, if the spring is actually installed someplace and you're trying to find this, um, how, can you find, how can we find w? How can you find the weight of anything? I'll give you a wire and I say calculate the weight of this wire. How do you do that? You're still bashed for after, after 10 weeks, huh? I'm sorry? You have to find the volume. Of course, you have the density because you know what the material is. You calculate the volume. So how do we calculate the volume in the case of a spring? Exactly the same way you calculate the volume of a rod. Cross-sectional area multiplied by the length. So W, therefore, W is equal to pi d squared over 4. That's the cross-sectional area. Multiplied by pi d times n a. By the way, any time we write n, it actually does mean number of active coils, even if I don't have a subscript a. Uh, the total number of coils, coils will have a subscript T on it, always. So N would be number of active coils, but here we're emphasizing. So pi D is the circumfer circumference of one coil. N A is the total number of active coils. Multiply those two and you get the volume. And to find W, multiply it by gamma, where gamma is the unit weight. If you want the mass, you can replace gamma by rho, the density of the material, and then you'll have the mass. And of course, the relationship between gamma and rho is with the acceleration of gravity g, and that's what you see in here as we switch from weight to uh, mass. When you find this, when you find the fundamental frequency or natural frequency of the spring, <coughs> this must be at least 15 to 20 times that of the applied load. Remember in shaft it was two times. So F should be greater than or equal to F spring F 
F applied. The frequency is usually measured in hertz, and that's what this is. So these frequencies are in cycles per second. Any questions? OK. Uh, we will now take a look at fatigue loading of springs then. So this always needs to be checked. And buckling as well. When you are either anal analyzing or designing a spring, doesn't matter. You have to check both of those. In fatigue loading, as I said before, uh, you give the spring a little bit of preload number one, to make sure that you're in the working range of the relationship between force and deflection. And number two, because you would like to keep the spring in place so that once you move the load off, it doesn't start to move on you. Of course, if it's in a hole or over a mandrel, uh, moving would not be a problem, but connection with the outside, uh, with the uh, sides of the hole, the whole wall, or with the mandrel would be a problem. So you don't want it to move very much. So they're always uh, under a uh, small amount of preload. Very similar to the fatigue loading that we've had before and done it for uh, bolts and all of those guys. You calculate your sigma m, sigma a, and then you Pick your failure theory, Goodman, Gerber, whatever, and do exactly as we did uh, before. The uh, force time diagram for the springs looks something like this. It's always a little bit of preload. It never goes, hopefully never goes to zero, the force. So that's, that's what would, you would be looking at. So. This would be your FM. That would be your FA. This is the force time diagram. So mean and alternating values of the load are found. And then the uh, stresses are calculated as before, uh, KB or KW, whichever you want to use, either one will work. 8 FAD divided by pi D cubed, where FA is the alternating value of the force. Remember, we had this general equation before. Tau M. Eight FMD divided by pi d cubed. In some cases, for static loading, not for fatigue. For fatigue, you always have to use either KB or KW. Uh, but sometimes, and you will see that in some of my example problems that haven't been changed, I need to change those. Uh, you use KS, the shear stress correction factor, and not KB or KW. The difference is about 10% or so. Uh, but if it's static loading, remember that all of this is because of stress concentration due to curvature. And we said in stress concentration uh, considerations, when you're doing static loading, 
the uh, stress concentration factor decreases if the material yields. Material gets stronger if it yields, therefore we might not use that. So you'll see either one of those, uh, whether, whether you use it or not. Um, it's essentially up to you. Um, however, your book uses this, so you might as well go ahead and do just one value, either KB or KW, uh, all the time. Now, once we find these, This takes care of the stress part of fatigue. For the strength part, oops, tower. We need these two values, SSE. and SSU. SSE is the endurance limit in shear. And you can calculate it from the equations that we had for fatigue, uh, if you know the surface condition and all of that. Uh, or, and of course then you have, we're going to have to bring in the stress concentration factor too. Or you can uh, get it from equations that relate this endurance limit in shear to the strength of the spring. SSU, the ultimate strength in shear, uh, generally is taken at, of course, it's verified by experiment. 67% of SUT. Uh, what remains is to calculate the value of SSE. And again, you can go to the uh, considerations in fatigue loading, general fatigue loading, to find that. Uh, or use an equation uh, that is in your book. It's called the Zimmerly data. It's on page 528. And there are two equations, equation 1028 and 1029. And these will give you these values. Now I want to show you what these values are. Uh, for two different types of wire, Thirty five KSI, two hundred and forty one MPA. Uh, I'll do it this way. SSM fifty five KSI equal to 379 MPA. And then SSU, oh sorry, for pinned wire, SSU or SSA is equal to 57 and a half KSI, equal to 398 MPA. And SSM is 77 and a half KSI equal to 534 MPA. What this is, 
If you recall, when we did fatigue in general, and we analyzed the part, and we found that under the applied stresses, it didn't have an infinite life. It had a finite life. So when we do this diagram, um, sorry, sigma a here, sigma m here. When we do this diagram, let's say this is our, this was our SE, this is SUT. Let's say you're using Goodman. You connect these two, that's your strength line. You find a set of stresses, sigma A and sigma M, and you plot them here. And that becomes your load line. Your factor of safety is OB over OA. if that's where your point plots. Now, what if the point plots here? <coughs> then the ratio, then A becomes A, your A in this case is over here. OB to OA is less than 1 now, which means that the part does not have a life of 10 to the 6. This is for 10 to the 6. The question becomes, what is the life? You connect from here to here. You find this value. That becomes your fatigue strength. And then you go to this equation, SF equals A n to the B. Find your B, uh, B and A constant. Put, it, put this SF over here and come up with the number of cycles, whatever that may be. So this is 10 to the 6. And that's some number of cycles. We don't know <laughs> how many. And that's the way we find it. I go through that in order to show you what these numbers are. These numbers give you this point. For a life of 10 to the 6, however. In other words, they, they give you that point. So when they say SSM and SSA in this case, this is what they say. This is what they mean. It's this. And that. Now, if you want to use Goodman's criterion, you do exactly what we did here with that red line. And there is your SSE. That's your value. The book gives you an example using not the Goodman line, but the Gerber line. Remember that the Gerber line is from SSU to that point parabolic. And it turns out to be something like this. So this is SSE Gerber. That's SSE Goodman. That's how we come up with SSE and then plot it. As I said, he's shown you that for the uh, Gerber criterion, you can use it for Goodman, you can use it for ASME. If you do use it for ASME, then you need to uh, include the yield strength. We 
could use Soderbergh for that matter too, if you wanted to. So that's what that is, and you can use it in any of these equations. In the absence of that, if you don't have access to these values, and of course you also need an equation, uh, you can use two values which are sort of average for all of these. They're not exact by any means. They're average. And those values are these. So as approximate values, we'll put them over here. So this is from this this is called Zimmerly Zimmerly data. In general, you can use for unpinned, I'll just erase this and put it out here in line with those um, approximate values. This is for steels, of course. Uh, for uh, unpinned wire, SSE, you can use 45 KSI, which is the same as 310 MPa. And for pinned, SSE equals 67.5 KSI equal to 465 MPa. You will see me using these values in a couple of example problems that we will go over today. So, uh, and we, we may use actually Zimmerly data to compare with those values in these problems as well. Any questions? Okay, I have some uh, springs here. I have a whole bunch of springs, but most of them are very small. Uh, so I'm going to send in a representative sample. One compression spring with uh, squared and ground ends, uh, and you will see how you're, you, you're going to use one, almost one coil. Uh, one is a tension spring that we'll talk about today in probably in the second hour. And one, a torsional spring, which we'll take a look at next time. So I'll just take a look at those. The uh, extension spring, the uh, tensile spring rather than compression spring, um, has been pulled too far and it's yielded and it's no longer, the coils are not touching one another. Of course, you can do that to the extension spring. They, they're, supposed to be, uh, they're supposed to have their coils touching one another. Okay. Any questions before we do example problems? All right. Let's take a look at this example problem then. Uh, this is in your handout. It says a helical compression spring Ooh. has 14 active coils. Usually active coils should be limited to somewhere between 3 and about 15 or so. So this is near the top end. A helical compression spring has 14 active coils, a free length of 1.25 inches, and an outside diameter of 7 16 of an inch. The ends of the spring are squared and ground, and the end plates are constrained to be parallel. So it's between flat parallel plates. 
The material is music wire with presetting. The wire diameter is fixed at 0.042 inches. So that's the wire diameter we're going to use. And the outside diameter is also given. This is not a design problem. This is an analysis problem. You don't need to assume anything. Everything that you need is here. All you have to do is to make sure that with the given forces, the spring is adequate. So you're really analyzing and not designing. Find. For static conditions, compute the spring rate, the solid length, the stress when the spring is compressed to solid height, and will static yielding occur while bringing the spring to its solid length? B, for dynamic conditions, with P min equal to 0.9 pounds force, P max 2.9 pound force, will the spring experience torsional endurance limit fatigue? In other words, will it have infinite life? Torsional yielding or torsional fatigue failure, finite life? Assume a survival probability of 90%, unpinned coils, and fatigue failure based on 50,000 cycles. Uh, so first, if you're going to check to see if it has infinite lives, you have to check it for 10 to the 6 cycles, of course. And then for 50,000 cycles, you're going to have to find uh, the uh, factor of safety. So let's take a look at the preliminaries here, then we'll take a break and continue when you come back. Uh, <clears throat> the value of C, the spring index, is used a lot in our calculations. So you should find that more or less as a first step. Spring index is D over D. And remember that capital D is the mean coil diameter. What is given is the outside diameter of the spring. The mean coil diameter is the outside diameter minus one wire diameter. Divide that by D and you get 9.4. So the value of C is nicely in the middle range of values that we said are appropriate for a spring, somewhere between 3 and 12 or 4 and 12, sorry. Uh, the shear stress correction factor, Ks, as before, dependent on C, 1.05. And this is the wall correction factor, 1.15. Notice that there's about a 10% difference between the two. And that's usually the case. We, uh, you will see me using this Ks in uh, static calculations. Sometimes those are used. Uh, with no stress concentration factor. But for fatigue calculations, we'll have to use that. Um, your book uses actually this for both fatigue calculations and static calculations. Um, you can go ahead and use it for both as well if that's more comfortable for you. Or if you use just KS for static calculations, that's OK too. The spring has 14 active coils, squared and ground ends. That adds two more. So total number of coils is 16. <coughs> we are doing this in order to find the solid height. We need to know what the solid height is so that we can calculate force at solid height and so on. Uh, solid length, LS, is the wire diameter times the total number of coils. Now, if you go to the table that's in the book, uh, allowing you to calculate the solid length, you will see that it's probably off from this by one wire diameter or something, half a wire diameter, something like that. Uh, I generally take a look at this and say, how many coils, and just simply multiply that by the diameter and call it the solid length. Um, the difference is very, very small. Uh, as you can see, 
This is 0.04, even if it's off by one wire diameter, 0.04 as compared to 0.67. In other words, a ratio of 4 to 67, about 5%, a little bit more. So, but that's, that's good enough for our purposes. Deflection at solid height. It's the free length minus the solid length. They say spring has a free length of 1.25 inches. Subtract that, subtract the solid length from that, and you'll find the deflection at solid height. Uh, does everybody understand that, that calculation? Uh, I can draw you a little picture on the board to show you exactly what that looks like. Looks like this. Free length. Well, I guess I have too many coils there. Solid length. Deflection at solid length. So deflection at solid length is free length minus the solid length. The force at solid length requires the calculation of the spring rate or the spring constant. Fs is equal to K delta S. K d to the fourth G divided by 8 d cubed N. Remember we uh, uh, came up with this equation last time. Here I've replaced a d over d cubed by a c cubed. It's easier for calculation. Other than that, you can use either one. G for steel, 11 and a half times 10 to the 6 psi. The value of K, according to that equation, then comes out to be 5.1 pounds per inch. And the force at solid height turns out to be approximately 3 pounds. Uh, here, I've used um, KS. Uh, I'll give you numbers if you use KW, because I've changed that in my notes, but I didn't put it either. You have KS or KW? You have KS, right? You're, or KW? KW? Oh, oh so you have 1.17. Or a 1, what was it? 1.15, okay, 1.15, yes, yes, okay, then that's good. Uh, so leave it there, that's fine. Uh, this number comes out to be, if I remember correctly, 46,800? Yeah. Okay, that, that's fine, just leave it there like that. Sometimes we just use the uh, shear stress correction factor, but it's exactly the same as the equation we had before. Uh, KS or KW8 FS, force at solid height. This is the stress, maximum stress at solid height. And that comes out to be, in the calculations that you have, 46,800. And then we will take a look at the yield strength in shear. To do that, we need to calculate the tensile strength of the material because the shear strength is related to that. The equation that I had on the board a while back, SUT equals A divided by D to the M, 311 KSI. A and M you find from that table. I'm taking the yield strength in shear, approximately the middle value. Do I still have that here? No. Uh, where we said the yield strength in shear is somewhere between 35% and 52% of the ultimate strength. I'm taking the middle value there, 124 KSI. So 
the factor of safety against yielding is about 2.9. And notice that with 46,800, this is going to be a little bit smaller, maybe 2.5 or so, 2.4, 2.5, something like that. Still good. Uh, usually in springs that are uh, functioning under fatigue, we use a small factor of safety to bring down the weight to increase, remember this equation, we use a small factor of safety to be able to use a smaller diameter to reduce the weight, to increase the frequency so that no surging occurs. That's why we usually use very small uh, factors of safety. This is not for dynamic loading or fatigue loading. This is static loading, and usually it's larger than the one in for the dynamic loading. That's why you see it at 2.9. Any questions? Okay, let's take a break. So we should check buckling. Of course, the, the uh, problem states that you should check that. Um, whether or not the problem states that, that's something that you must do, regardless of whether it's asked for or not. So you remember this equation. Remember, we're talking about steel. Uh, alpha, the, the effective cylinderness ratio. Alpha is the end condition, just like in columns. LO is the free length, and D is the main mean coil diameter. So you calculate that, and if it's less than 2.63, there will be no buckling. And in this case, it is less than 2.63. That's only for steels. For any other material, you have to go to the original equations and calculate that number. That comes out to be 2.63 for steel. Remember the equation that I gave you last time? That includes the two constants, C1 and C2, <coughs> which are functions of the elastic properties of the material E and G. Uh, I wrote all of those on the board last time. The applied loads, uh, let's, let's read about the applied loads, by the way. So uh, refresh your memory. The applied loads are P min equals 0.9 pound force, P max 2.9. And we would like to a survival probability of 90%. This is like our reliability factor. This is from a different book, this problem is. And some of the nomenclature and symbols are different in, in general in all books. Uh, for example, what we call K, the modifying factors in your book, uh, this book calls Cs. So what you should do, rather than uh, sort of memorize these as symbols and say, what is K, what is C, or whatever, uh, know what they are, know what they mean, uh, regardless of what they're called. And uh, that way, you won't have any problems uh, switching from one book to the other as you do work. Uh, will the spring experience torsional endurance limit? And I talked about those. Uh, survival probability of 90%. Unpeened cores, fatigue failure based on 50,000 cycles. So we'll do infinite and, of course, 50,000 cycles as well. So back to this page. The load varies between 2.9 and 0.9, so there's your alternating value of the load, one pound. Mean value of the load, 1.9 pounds. And using the equation that we have with Kw, and this one I've used, I've written Ks here, but I've actually used Kw. So just, just cross that S out and make it W. The calculation is correct. Just cross that out or change that to W. You use each of the two forces, the alternating value of the force and the mean value of the force, to calculate the alternating value of the stress and the mean value of the stress. 
And these are the stresses which will give you the point that you would like to plot. Now you have to draw your strength line. Here, this is pin, this is unpinned wire. Uh, I've used this approximate value that I gave you, that it was here, I just erased it. Remember these two values, I'll rewrite them again. That's what I'm using. You could use the Zimmerli data. If you use the Zimmerli data with the Goodman, we just did it in the previous section, this comes out to be 42.5. Uh, let's just, let me show you how to do that just in case you want to do that. This is again on page 528. The equation looks like this. SSE equals SSA divided by 1 minus SSM divided by SSU squared. This is Gerber. Goodman would look like this. SSA divided by 1 minus SSM over SSU. <coughs> no square. And this, I believe, if I remember correctly, with these numbers, SSA for unpinned wire, this is 35. That is 55. And SSU, uh, we calculate that as 67% of SUT, 208. You could run the calculations again, see if that's correct, if I remember correctly or not. But you can use either one of these two. It's not a big deal. Depending on the failure criterion that you use, this equation changes. These equations are given in the table in your book, and you can use those equations to come up with this. Uh, but in this case, in this problem, I've used, just used this approximate value of 45. Multiplied by 0.9 because we need a survival rate of 90%. Remember that in everything that we have done, we have assumed the uh, probability of survival, we've called it reliability, to be equal to 1. Remember k sub r. We have this equation, se equals ka, kb, and all of those guys, kr, se prime. We've used that as 1. Well, if you design with that number equal to 1, that means that 50% of your parts will fail under the applied loads. Not a good design. So usually reliability factor, 90% minimum is what you use. Uh, so that's the reason why I've multiplied the value of SE by this reliability factor, KR. Or in this case called probability of survival, uh, which gives you the shear endurance limit of 208 KSI. So, here's your 40.5. Now we're drawing Goodman. Your SUT, that's for 10 to the 6, this line. You write the equation of the Goodman line. This, is, this now is exactly the same as before. No change. None whatsoever. We're back to 
fatigue, except that this is in shear. That's all. Uh, so 40.5, 208, Goodman line, there is its equation. Load line, well, you have the two stresses. 15.7 is tau A, 29.8 is tau M. There is SA over SM, that's that line. Solve the two together, you get SA, this. It's actually, all of these should have a subscript S under them. Do they have them in your uh, notes or not? You should, you should put the subscript S here. All of these are in shear. So S before A here, S before M there, the same here, the same there, and the same there. So these are all should read SSA, SSM, and so on. So SSA comes out to be 29.6 divided by sigma A, 1.9 factor of safety for fatigue. So this, is, this should be OK for infinite life. But let's calculate it for 50,000 as well, because that's what they are requiring too. And before that, we say torsional yielding should not occur, because the spring doesn't yield by the time it gets to solid height. So if it doesn't yield by the time it gets to solid height, it's not going to leak, yield. Uh, factor of safety should be somewhat higher. For 50,000 cycles, and there's a zero missing there, it's 50,000, not 5,000. The calculations are correct, I just dropped that zero there. So please put a zero. 50 times 10 to the 3. Okay, good. So where were you when we were stopped? What was I talking about? Go back to the top. Okay. Okay, then we're good. So um, fatigue analysis for a limited number of cycles or limited life as opposed to infinite life. It's done exactly as um, the equations that you have for fatigue, with one exception. That exception is that in the SN diagram that we looked at when we talked about fatigue, this being one, this being a thousand, and that being a million, we had this. We said this value here is S F S U T. Remember that? F was a factor that you found from that graph that depended on the tensile strength of the material. F S U T. And we wrote the equation for this line. I cycle for T. We use this F S U T. And usually that FSUT was somewhere between 0.7 and 0.9. In shear fatigue, in fatigue under torsion, if you will, this value of F is closer than point, uh, closer to 0.72 than it is to 0.9 or 0.85 or anything like that. So the this is, that's, I have that little mark there too to tell you that where that number comes from. It is from here. The value of F equals 0.72 in shear. 
So with that, <coughs> we calculate A and B, put it into this equation. SSF is 71.5. And again, remember what that is. This is SSU, SSF, 50,000 cycles. That's with sigma A and sigma M on the axes. That's the Goodman line. So that's why we calculated that, because we need the line for 50,000 cycles, not a million cycles. But other than that, everything else remains the same. The only thing that has changed now is this value. And that replaces SSE. Everything else remains exactly the same. And of course, you should get a factor of safety larger than 1.9, because this is now for 50,000 cycles and not a million cycles. Any questions? OK. Let's take a look at another problem. This one is a design problem. As I mentioned, uh, in design problems, uh, you need to make a number of assumptions because all that is given usually are some general requirements. And there is no single value for or single design that works. There are probably a number of designs that do work, any of them so long as they satisfy all conditions, fine. Um, should I give you something or a problem that requires design? Then uh, I will also give you some guidance as to the assumptions that you should make. Because if I give you a design problem and some of you take a C value of 7, the other people take a C value of 8 or 9 or 10, and then another wire diameter of 5 or 4. And then uh, I'll have to solve that many number of problems before I know whether you did things correctly or not. So I will give you some guidance as to uh, what to assume. For example, I say assume a value of c equal to 7 and whatever else may be needed. Uh, and then let you go through the problem like that. Um, and if I do that, and you go through the problem, depending on other assumptions that you make, your solution may or may not work. So if I do give you a problem of that nature in the final, I will ask you to go through one iteration only. So you go throughout through the whole problem and to go to one iteration. And if it doesn't work, OK, it doesn't work. You don't do it again, because you're not going to have time to do that. <coughs> what you would do then, you say, oops, this did not work in so far as surge is concerned. I need to reduce the weight. In order to reduce the weight, I'm going to reduce the wire diameter, for example. And a reduction in the wire diameter may or may not have an effect on the factor of safety. Well, it, ha it will have an effect, but it may or may not bring that factor of safety below the required value. You're done with the problem at that stage. You don't need to do it again. Uh, so this is an example <coughs> of that sort. A camshaft rotates 650 RPM causing a follower to raise and lower once per revolution. The follower is to be held against the cam by a helical compression spring 
with a force that varies between 300 and 600 newtons. As the spring length varies over a range of 25 millimeters. Ends are to be squared and ground. The material is to be shot pin chrome vanadium steel valve spring wire ASTM A232 with fatigue strength properties as represented in figure 1216. Figure 1216 belongs to that book and uh, we will do this our own way. We'll come up with a different way of uh, getting values. Presetting is to be used, determine suitable values of D, D, N, LF. LF is the free length. Uh, N is the number of active coils. If there's no subscript, that's the number of active coils. Include in the solution a check for possible buckling and spring surge. First, you have to, design, you have to decide uh, what you're designing this for, what kind of life. Well, 650 RPM million cycles occurs in 26 hours. So unless this is something you're going to use for one day, you should be designing for infinite life. So that's basically how you decide on what to do. We assume a value of C equal to 8. And this is an assumption you're going to have to make. And a wire diameter of 5 millimeters. Notice that nothing is given. They're, they, they're not talking about the outside diameter, they're not talking about the inside diameter, nothing. So we calculate, we assume these two values and run through the calculation. Of course, this almost works uh, except for one minor, uh, well, actually not minor, one minor deviation, but not minor point. Uh, so I have not changed that, we just go through this. Because uh, I did this a number of times before it, it came out correctly like that. So, SUT, AD to the M, all of these factors are found from the tables. Notice that this is in the metric system, therefore you pick off values in the metric system. For almost 1400 MPa is the tensor strength of the material. The yield strength is taken as half of that approximately. Remember, this was between 0.35 and 0.52. We're taking it as high strength steel near the upper boundary, 0.5. About 700 MPa. Use a small factor of safety to minimize weight, 1.2 factor of safety. And to account for exceeding tau max, this should help to prevent possible sorts. So take a small factor of safety for exceeding the yield strength so that your spring will not be very heavy. Allowable stress then is equal to the, oh, please add S in here. That should be SSY, yield strength in shear, SSY. Allowable shear stress is the yield strength in shear, 697, divided by a factor of safety of 581 MPa. This is now the allowable stress. It's okay for that stress to exist in the spring. Now, with all of that, you can check tau max. Mean coil diameter is 40 millimeters. This comes from this equation. We assume that to be 8 and assume that to be 5. Therefore, mean coil diameter is 40 millimeters. K is um, 1.05. This is Ks, by the way. Uh, this is C plus 1 divided by C. And um, Oh, sorry, 2C plus 1 divided by 2C, 1.05. And I believe in your notes as well, I've used 1.05 here. Is that correct? Yeah. This is using KS rather than uh, KW or um, KF, or KW or KB. Uh, if you use those, this will be about 10% higher, so it'll be about 560 
it will still be, actually, I think I have it in my notes. So rather than guessing at it, I'll give you the number. Yeah, uh, KB comes out to be 1.17. And tau max, you want to write that next to it, that's fine. Uh, tau max comes out to be 572 MPa. Still less than 581 MPa. Number four, spring constant. And here's where you should read the statement of the problem carefully. It says that force that varies between 360 and 600 newtons as the spring length varies over a range of 25 millimeters. They're effectively giving you the spring rate. So the difference is 300 newtons. Due to that difference, the spring deflects 25 millimeters. The force rate is 12 newtons per millimeter. So that's the spring constant or spring rate. G4 steel, 79,000 MPa. And then we go to this equation. I should write that equation. You could write that equation next to this right over here. It's this equation. K equals d to the fourth g divided by 8 d cubed na. That's the equation. In that equation, we have the wire diameter. We have the modulus of rigidity, mean coil diameter. We've just found the spring rate. We can calculate na. Na comes out to be 8. By the way, this does not need to be a round number. So if you get an A equals 8.5, it's 8.5. It's OK. Nothing wrong with it. And since it's squared and ground, then NT is equal to 10. We need the uh, factor of safety at solid height to see what stress is um, applied at solid height. Uh, the solid length is no total number of coils times d, so 50 millimeters. The free length is the solid length plus the deflection at solid length. Uh, that picture that I had there before, this is the same equation, the free length is the solid length plus the deflection at solid length. And uh, <clears throat> the force at solid height, we will assume that to be 10% more than the maximum. Now, this is a little bit less than the approved. Remember, the, this is this. That equation, with C equal to, we said C should be 15% or so. Here I've taken just 10%, again, to reduce weight. Therefore, the free length is the solid length, 50 millimeters, plus the load at solid height divided by K, a total of 105 millimeters. So that's the free length. And... Uh, we now use that free length to check for buckling. Um, alpha is 0.5. This is between two parallel plates, essentially, as you can take a look at the picture. <clears throat> so alpha is 0.5. Free length is 105. Mean coil diameter is 40. This is less than 2.63. So buckling is not a problem. Uh, 
100 div divided by 40 is 2.5 times 0.5 is certainly less than 2.63. So <clears throat> we should check it for surge as well. We check for surge. This is between two fa flat parallel plates again, 1 half square root of k over m. This is that same equation except written for the metric system. You can use it this way or the way it was before. This was the way it was before. W divided by G is M. It's weight versus mass. Same thing. There's K. There's G. I'm calculating, I'm, I'm coming up with weight. Actually, I've used this equation. Even though I show K over M, I, I've used that equation. There's G. That's 9.81 but in millimeters per second squared, not meters per second squared. Uh, pi d times the number of active coils. Pi d is the uh, circumference of a coil times the number of active coils. Cross-sectional area of the wire and multiplied by the unit weight of steel in the metric system. That's w, the unit weight, uh, that's gamma, the unit weight of steel. So gamma is 76 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons per millimeters cubed. Uh, according to this equation, F comes out to be 140 cycles per second. This equation is all in cycles per second, or hertz. Uh, 625 RPM is approximately 10.4 cycles per second. So the ratio is 14 almost. And the recommended ratio, minimum recommended ratio, was 15, remember. This is a little bit less than that, and this is one point in the, in the design that doesn't exactly check. You can go back, since you have good factors of safety in yielding and fatigue, and reduce the uh, length of the spring. You'll see the factor of safety and fatigue in just a minute. So fatigue, there's KB, 1.17. Mean force, it goes between 300 and 600, 450. Alternating force, 150. And tau A and tau M, and of course, tau M is three times tau A. So tau m, 3 times tau a. SSE 465, again, I've used this. This is peened. Oh, I have these switched. Please correct that. If you have rewritten it, correct that. Unpeened must be less than peened. It can't be more than peened. Uh, this is peened wire, and that's 465 MPa. So that's what I'm using. You can, once again, use the Zimmerli data. SSU, 67% of SUT, 935. And again, Please put some S's here if they are not there already. That should be SSA, SSM, SSA, SSM, and so on. But the equations are correct and written for that diagram. Equation of the strength line, the Goodman line. Equation of the load line, SA equals 186 divided by 143 or 1.39. As you can see, we have a higher factor of safety than the minimum requirement. So it is possible to go back and change the wire diameter and thereby reduce the weight to make sure that that surge that was 14 will become larger than 15. 
And also we could increase that to 1.5 as well. To, uh, sorry, not 1.5, 0 0.15%. 0 Any questions? Summary of the design is underneath. So let's take a uh, quick look at um, tension springs. As you saw from the one that I sent out, these are round shut with some preload in them. In other words, when you apply a load to these, uh, if the load is small enough, initially there will be no deflection it will take a while before any deflection occurs. Uh, we call that load the preload in the spring, very similar to the preload in um, bolts. In order to load tension springs, we have to have what are called hooks or some way at the two ends so that we can apply a force. Such as, for example, what you see on the screen. This hook has a curvature like this, and then has a curvature right here into the screen. Which curvature you see over here? That's curvature. So there's two curvature turns like this and then turns like that coming towards you. It rotates like this. There are two curvatures there. If I draw that two-dimensionally, of course, you will only see one of them. But I'll do that just to show you what we mean by all of this. So it has to have these hooks so that you can apply a force here and a force there. And usually the hooks are of, of the same size, not different size. Although you can have them different if you wish. Uh, therefore, if you have something like this, then a section like this will be under bending and axial load. You have to calculate the stresses here and make sure that they don't go beyond the yield strength of the material with some factor of safety. Take into consideration the stress concentration due to curvature. And of course, there's a, there's an, a um, direct or axial stress as well. So sigma bending. <coughs> This is at B, as you are taking a look at the screen, the uh, spring that I have here, is equal to K bending times 32M divided by pi d cubed. K bending, uh, stress concentration due to curvature, uh, plus 4F divided by pi d squared, the axial stress. That's the total stress in the material. The value of, uh, and M, um, is F times the hook diameter divided by 2. In other words, F times the radius of the hook, that distance. Uh, the value of KB, the bending stress concentration factor, is 4C1 squared minus C1 minus 1 divided by 4C1 times C1 minus 1, where C1 
is 2RM divided by D, where RM is this distance, mean hook radius. So that's as far as the bending stress is concerned. What you don't see in the uh, two-dimensional picture that I have on the board is a torsional stress. Take a look on the board. And notice that if I apply a load here going to the left right along that line, then this area here, that section, will be under torsion. Or if I apply a load here, this part will be under torsion. It's also curved. It's a part of the hook. So you have to take a look at the shear stress at that point as well. That is calculated by bringing in a K shear, if you will. 8FD divided by pi d cubed. Same equation we had before. Where K shear is equal to 4C2 minus 1 divided by 4C2. RM shear, for lack of anything else. This is the mean radius, not of this hook here, but of that bend there. The two are not the same. So it comes in like this, and it bends around towards you. So there's one curvature here, one curvature here. This one, the big one, we take into account for bending this other one, which is more or less parallel to the uh, cross section of the spring, is for shear. But other than that, that's how you calculate those equations. Aside from that, in uh, the definitions for Tension springs, while we have, I have this picture up on the board, let me show you some of the nomenclature here. This is called the body length, LB. That's the hook diameter, either on top or on the bottom. This is the free length of the spring. Therefore, we can write, I'll write it over here. The free length is equal to the body length plus two times hook diameter. The body length is calculated from this equation. And remember that in springs, all coils are active. There are no inactive coils. There are no dead coils. Not only that, but besides the coils, these hooks deform as well. So when you pull it, some deflection is going to come from those hooks. And that deflection, of course, will be a part of the deflection of the spring. So we're going to have to take those into consideration as well. We convert those two parts 
of the two hooks into active coils using this equation. The equivalent number of active coils is this. Na is equal to Nb plus G over E. NB is the number, this is the number of active coils, NB, number of coils in body. In other words, in the length LB. And lastly, a difference between, as I said before, a difference between tension springs and compression springs is the force deflection diagram. The springs are wound shut with some preload, so until you get you uh, get the applied load equal to that preload, there will be no deflection. So the diagram does not start from zero and it starts from here at the preload. And then, of course, you have a linear variation. The equation for force deflection. Um, F equals F I plus K times S. K is this. So that's the equation for tension springs. Other than that, everything is the same as compression springs. Tension springs are in they, they're in torsion, except that in compression spring, the torsion was produced by a compressive load. It's now produced by a tensile load. All that has changed is the direction of the shear stress, not the magnitude. Everything else being the same, of course. So. The equations are the same. The analysis will also be the same. Any questions? OK. I'll see you on Thursday. I'll talk about the final on Thursday as well.